ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, how to become a lawyer in 30 minutes. We're going to go ahead and have this discussion. Just had to make sure that my voice was recording. I'm going to try to make this video 30 minutes long. Many people have been dealing with the courts, and when I say dealing with, the courts have become your adversary. You go into court, and the judge wants to start arguing with you. They don't argue with the other side, but they do argue. Now, they have a stenographer. The reason why the courts have a stenographer where they claim they're recording everything is because the judge gets to act a fool, but it doesn't get to be recorded by the stenographer. See, the stenographer doesn't record emotion. They only record what people say, not how they said it. So there are no explicits, there are no exclamation marks, things like that put in there because the stenographer is not allowed to give their opinion. So demand the hearing be audio recorded. Now remember, the stenographer doesn't work for you. The stenographer is not an officer of the court. The stenographer is a private party who has been hired by the court to stenographer the matter. So what you do is you demand audio recording. One second. Now remember, you're not dealing with the judge. The judge has no standing in the court, especially if you demand a trial by jury. Now, please understand, you need to understand because you don't get it, go back and watch the previous video, a trial by jury is not the same as a jury trial. Never was, never was intended to be, but you all have allowed the courts to say certain phrases over and over and over and over and over again to where you got comfortable with it. Like the word pleading, Oh, yeah, what, uh, I received your pleading. No, you didn't receive no sort of pleading from me. I ain't give you no pleading. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't ever put a pleading in the court. You don't ever use pleading paper. It's not a requirement. What's pleading paper? It's the document, the court document, that got the lines on the side and the numbers. Never use pleading paper. Why? Why can't I use pleading paper? One second. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why you don't use pleading paper, this document right here at the very beginning, um, the first thing it does is it identifies what the common opinion of the court is. That's what you want. You don't want to just be throwing out case law. You want to highlight that this is what other courts recognize. These are not your opinions. You are not given your thoughts. You are given what is the fact. So the first thing that everybody needs to understand is this case right here. This is Rhode Island versus Massachusetts. It's an 1838 case. Courts have no jurisdiction to hear a matter unless there's a controversy. So as I told you before, once the court creates a controversy, ah, now you have rights. There's no controversy. There, there is no right to the court. Sorry. It's just the same. They need a controversy. All right? But a judge must have authority, so you bring that this is coming under the judicial power. Sorry, they don't like judicial power. They like administrative power, legislative power, because that gives them greater authority. One moment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the incarceration contract. This contract is modeled after Bradley Christopher Stark contract. Now, this is one of the cases in Bradley Christopher Stark, the 1895 case. To show you that the group, Bradley Christopher Stark, uh, Demetrius Hawkins, and Mr. Michael Rideout, did their research and knew what they were saying, which is why we stand right behind each one of these contracts and the questions that they ask. This speaks us to pleading, the charging instrument, document, indictment, and does not admit the validity of the statute law cited therein and does not thereby form an issue for trial which would exist even without a plea and without which there would be nothing before the court or the jury for trial. Now, I want you to pay attention to this statement right here, okay? This is this case right here, 1927, but pay attention. The very act of pleading to it, an indictment, Admit the genius of the record. That's why you don't enter a plea. You're not required to enter a plea. Let's go to that case. Frisbee. Frisbee. That's right. Frisbee versus United States. So let's pay attention. 
The defect, however, is waived if objection was not made in the first instance and before trial. Really? So you must challenge at the very beginning? Aww. Hold on. Let's go down here. And this connection references made to Section 1025 Revised Statutes, which reads, No indictment found or presented by a grand jury in any district or circuit or other court of the United States shall be deemed insufficient, nor shall trial, judgment, or other proceeding thereupon be affected by reason of any defect or imperfection in matters of form only, which shall not tend to the prejudice of the defendant. Ladies and gentlemen, basically they're saying an indictment is an indictment. You can't challenge the indictment because somebody made a mistake. There is a typo. That's what they're saying. Pay attention. The endorsement, what an I, the endorsement, the grand jury stamps it and endorses it as a true bill. It's a check. Sorry, I got to share something. Take care of that. Give me one second. I had to go take care of something else, something different. All right, personal business. That was me taking care of the solar earlier, but then I had to go brush my teeth. Sorry. Um, one of those things I forgot, so I had to go take care of that. you got to have a minty fresh mouth. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, the endorsement was no part of the charges against the defendant. If no indictment had in fact been found by the grand jury, in other words, if there was no legal accusation against him, the defendant should have objected to this on the ground on this ground when the court called upon him to plead to this, which it assumed to have been properly presented it. The very fact of pleading to it admits the genius of the record. Ladies and gentlemen. Now, this is a 1895 case, but this case right here, the very fact of pleading to it, let's go here. I've not done it before. We're going to only stay 30 minutes. Just got to explain this. Um, you're not even going to find an attorney that's going to be telling you about this. But guess what? It pulls up right here. The very fact of pleading to it admits the genius of the record. Geniusness? What the... Instead of denying the existence of any legal accusation, the defendant demurred. Ladies and gentlemen, you deny that there is no legal accusation, lawful accusation. Don't use the word legal. Don't use the word legal. Lawful. Legal is statutory. Lawful is constitutional. What, you didn't know that there was a difference between the two, legal and lawful? The courts do. Oh, by the way, this is free. Me. So when I put that case in, it didn't actually pull up the case. I guess it can't find the case. This is 1928. They used the very same case. Ladies and gentlemen, feel free to use this information. The very fact of pleading to the matter. Just need to understand that. Admit. That's where you are admitting guilt. Just by pleading. You're submitting to the court. Look. The very fact of pleading to the matter admits its geniusness as a record. You don't plead. You're not required to plead. The court can't enter a plea in your behalf. The court enters a plea in your behalf. It's acting as your counsel. It cannot do that. It is strictly prohibited from doing that. There is no rulemaking that can give it authority to act as your counsel. Let's see. Other individuals have used this in their cases, but what I can't find is the original case. Um, let's see. Nope, that won't work. It won't give me the original case. These are all recent. So we're going to do a search search. And the first case that talked about it is Frisbee. Yeah, there is no cases that predates Frisbee. Uh, that talks about this that I can find. So what I do is, let's go to Google. 
You sure you want to go to Google? Let's go to Google. All right. I love hot time. I'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, I just found this site. This is site.case.law, and that's the actual site. Let let me show it to you so you can see it, and then I will tell you why I'm taking the time to show it to you. Uh uh-uh. We got to get that to refresh. One more time. Back on up. All right. Site.case.law. Site.case.law, ladies and gentlemen, this is what they do, and this is the only site that I've seen do anything like this. Welcome to Case Law Access Project. We allow free access to up to 500 cases per person per day. What the? So, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to keep signing up and signing up and signing up. And look at that. They'll even let you get a PDF. This is a case dealing with another one of those plea agreements, pleading to the indictment. When I said I wanted to look and see where it came from and where the history of that statement came from, this is a case that predates the one that we were looking at, 1895. This is 1875. Okay, and so what I'll do eventually, I haven't read it yet. I just immediately wanted to show you all what they offer. Okay, those of you who need to look up cases, need to look up statements and all that, by all means, I tell you, it is not as easy for me as case text, but the fact that they give you access, that's the thing. Okay? The fact that they give you access is the thing. So they do their little summary, and I'm not really, eh, Yeah, I I can't find it the way I'm looking for it, and so let's do that, and I'm going to pause y'all for a second, and then we're going to spend the last eight minutes talking about the other. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here's the point right here. The petition loosely drawn could not be demurred or motion for dismiss, be deemed not on demur, be deemed pleading, averring the fact on which the jurisdiction of the court depends. Pay attention. The fact on which the jurisdiction of the court depends. Deemed pleading, averring the fact on which the jurisdiction of the court depends. It is this sufficient, and defects are all amendable. Yes, you can always cure a defect in a document. And could not have been cured, or excuse me, could have been cured while the pleading was in faith. Amendable defects of this character cannot when the decree is collaterally assailed, in other words, attacked later, justify the sentence of nullity. Before such sentence is pronounced, want of jurisdiction, not its irregular exercise, should be manifest. You have to challenge jurisdiction at the very beginning, is what they're saying. That's why they're saying you. Now, technically, jurisdiction can be challenged at any time, but in this case, not for want of defects. Defects can be cured during the course of the proceeding. Let's see if we got one more. Huh. That's not it. That's the same statement. So that's where we're getting it from. This is one case. This is one case. This is one case. Now, we're going to leave the demurring part alone. Now we're going to talk about judges. Do you mind? Ladies and gentlemen, violation of one's oath of office strips them of immunity. Judicial immunity is not absolute. I tried to do a video on this, um, and the system muted it. Not on my end, because as you see, I checked the volume to make sure it was working. But on when it was completed, there is an AI algorithm. A lot of people don't understand it, so I'm going to briefly show it to you. Uh, yeah, we're going to keep that. Give me one second. I got to keep this too. Dag Nabbit. Let's go here. Yeah, this is the thing talking about a judge of probate court who held a criminal trial. He did not have any jurisdiction. So he acted in all excess or in clear absence 
of all jurisdiction over the subject matter. So a judge who acts in all access of jurisdiction, think clear absence of all jurisdiction if he merely acts in exercise of his authority. Okay? So it's clear absence of all jurisdiction. That's what you must challenge. That's what you must say about the judge when they violate your rights. Courts don't have the right to violate your rights. Let's do this. Artificial intelligence, free AI solutions. See, it just wants to focus on AI. What are bots and how do they work? Artificial intelligence chatbots are, no, you see, artificial intelligence bots. You won't see too many people talking about it. How these, auto, see, they talk about chatbots. We, we don't care about no chatbots. What's a chatbot? Those are the ones where you type in a, a question into some of these websites and it gives you an answer to whatever question you type in by Google. Google just doesn't chat back with you. Okay? What you need to understand is this bot, it's a virus. They'll never call it a virus, but it's a virus. It infects your computer, my computer, every other computer that connects to the Internet. It will sniff out whatever materials it wants. That's why some of you can't find certain documents. To this very day, you've been looking and looking and looking. You know you had that document. You had several copies of your document gone. That's why some people who were part of movements and everything had documents on their computer, and they keep talking about how they're all gone. Certain documents just gone. That's what's going on. But enough about that. Let's get back to the judges. Ladies and gentlemen, we got less than 13 minutes, so I'll go ahead and start explaining. As I stated at the very beginning of this, judges have a habit of arguing with people when they come into the court. You'll talk about your rights, and the judge will talk about you have no rights. Then they will talk about that they're going to enter a plea in your behalf. Judge has no authority under judicial power to enter a plea on anyone's behalf. The only time a judge can enter a plea on your behalf is if you are deemed incompetent. Go ahead. Go back and look at the record. The only time a judge can enter a plea on your behalf is if you have been deemed incompetent. If you have an attorney, you are deemed incompetent. Why? Because you gave him total power of attorney. So the next time the court says, we'll appoint an attorney for you, yeah, under limited power of attorney. I'm not giving the court my power of attorney, but I will give limited power of attorney to the attorney. And while acting as my attorney, there can be no conflict of interest. He cannot be an officer of the court and be my attorney at the same time. It is not permitted in law. That is a conflict of interest, and that is a denial of my right to counsel. Just that simple. Separation of powers. It's a separation of powers. Once he becomes your attorney, he can't be the attorney. That's a conflict of interest, ladies and gentlemen. He cannot be an attorney for the court. Because the prosecution is an attorney for the court. It's a conflict of interest. He cannot work for the enemy and work for you at the same time. If you really want to, hold on. Let me show it to you. One second. Ladies, this is a maxim. Gentlemen, this is a maxim. One cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So according to this, you cannot play for two masters. You cannot have, that's why dual citizenship doesn't work. You can't be citizens of two countries at the same time because you can't be in both countries at the same time. It's an oxymoron. You can't be from two countries at the same time. That's why there's no such thing as the so-called African-American. Nobody was ever born in Africa and America at the same time. Well, yes, they were because America had a colony. No, no, shut up. I'm sorry. I apologize. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
under this maxim. You cannot drive two cars at the same time. It's impossible. That's the same theory. That's the same doctrine. That's the same maxim. So an attorney cannot serve your interest and serve the court's interest. That's why attorney-client under CJS, give me one second, got to make this. Ladies and gentlemen, it can only happen on this channel. can't happen anyplace else because who else is going to do this? An attorney is the uh, implied authority to bind his client's interest and waive his client's rights. This happens every time, ladies and gentlemen. We talk about corporate jurors to come, but corporate jurors to come is not the only place. An attorney-client relationship may be characterized as an agent-principal relationship. This is the act of agency, ladies and gentlemen, agent-principal. You're the principal. He's supposed to be your agent. But when you allow the courts to appoint an attorney for you, pay attention. Oh, we'll appoint an attorney for you. No, I don't want you to appoint an attorney for me. I'm giving you limited power of attorney to assign an attorney to represent my interest. That's all you got to say. I, 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 excuse me, I didn't ask you. This is not a debate. My right to uh, uh, excuse me, my right to counsel is mine. You don't get to dictate my right to me. And shut, uh, uh, shut up with that stupidity. When it comes to my rights, you have no jurisdiction. So no, we ain't gonna have that conversation. You see, you're not disrespecting the court at that point. You're exercising your rights. You don't get to tell me what my rights are. Don't you ever think that you have the right to assume to tell me what my rights are. My rights belong to me. That's my property. You have no jurisdiction over my property. What did I just do? I just raised property interest. I just raised my right to property. I also raised my right to counsel. And I'm challenging the court's jurisdiction. I don't want to hear no opinions. You better show me where somebody gave you authority to exercise power and jurisdiction over my rights. I'm not submitted to your stupid jurisdiction. There you go. Now, you don't have to say it the way I said it because that's the way I talk to them. You can't talk to them that way. It doesn't work that way. You just need to take what I just said and put it in a language to where it would be the way you would say it. Okay? Hold on. But because there is more than an ordinary agency relationship, many special problems may arise during the course of an attorney's service on behalf of his client, especially with the fact of him being an officer of the court. I would tell you guys to read this. I'd tell you guys to read this. Guess what I did for y'all? While I had y'all on pause, I uploaded it. There it is right there under a legal understanding. Alphabetical order. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not plugged in. Battery's low. Sorry. Give me a second. I plugged in now. Woo wee I almost forgot. All right. So the document is loaded up so you guys can have that. Ladies and gentlemen, what I was explaining in that video is how a judge does not have absolute immunity. The problem with people is they try to sue judges. Judges are immune from civil lawsuits. Just that simple. You just have to understand that they are immune from civil lawsuits. They have to be sued criminally first. So you have to bring forth a criminal complaint against the judge. You cannot just sue a judge um, for some stupid act. See, when an official, when officials are threatened with personal liability for acts taken in pursuance to their official duty, uh, official duties, duties anyway, official duties, they may well be induced to act with an excess of caution or otherwise skew their decisions in a way that results in less than full fidelity to the objective of independent criteria that ought to guide their conduct. Now, hold on now. What they're saying is the fact that they could be held liable, judges could sit up there and err on the side of caution every single time. And that would be an injustice. And that, that's the truth. However, there is no judicial immunity for a judge to act outside of his jurisdiction. Okay? 
Look, the Supreme Court has held that the objective function of a judge performance requires that they be immune from suit for damages, but not immune from criminal liability. This is the stump case. And that's what I was highlighting in that video. Most of them are going to always refer to the stump case. So let's go back. Only judicial acts performed in clear absence of all jurisdiction when they violate your secured rights. No judge has the right to violate your secured rights. So you have to bring a criminal complaint against the judge, which is why we created the criminal complaint for you guys. However, I created a password for the document because I wanted to lock it to keep people from mutilating it and causing so many problems for everybody else in the future that I forgot the password. That's right. I forgot the password. Too many passwords. So what I'm doing is I'm recreating the document. It's only going to be three pages long, and I'll create one for those who are incarcerated as well. You must bring a criminal complaint. You must go to the attorney general. Here's the thing. If you have enough people, especially those of you incarcerated, if enough people of yours file these complaints with the attorney general against judges, not just one single judge, but several, you can do a quiet time lawsuit where you can represent the people of the state regarding the judges and how they treat people. You can use the laws in the incarceration contract to take care of a lot of things. Okay. Look, acknowledging an individual has a constitutional right to be free from illegal incarceration, I want to thank him because I am so glad that the case against me was overturned because they said So I am grateful that we have this and I'm getting ready to bring my complaint to get their attention against that judge for acting in the absence of clear and excuse me, clear absence of all jurisdiction. I told the judge, I said, Hey, look here, Ho. I, I didn't actually call her a hoe on the stand, but she knew she knew what I meant. I, I said, Look here, uh pros I mean I mean um look here, uh, woman. Um where's the order from the or original state? Just show me the order. No, then you have a case. But if you ain't got no order, then you need to shut up. What I told them. They needed an order from another judge in order to have a claim against me. There is no order. As a matter of fact, there is just the opposite. But they still held me for 22 months. So later this week, I'll be putting up a video showing you how I contacted the Department of Corrections via the 1099A and 1099C cancellation of debt. I already had a arbitration against them, and they called me up. What's this? We don't understand this. Can you please explain? And so I recorded the call, and I explained everything. Everything! So to put this in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, jurisdiction, if you want to judge, you have to bring forth a criminal complaint against the judge. You can start by going over the criminal complaint that's in that very same section on the website. Under PDF, you're going to go to a legal understanding, and you have the judicial complaint that's here as well under the legal understanding. Is it under legal understanding? Yeah, it's under legal understanding. Just type in judicial complaint under PDF, and it'll take you right to it. And use that information there. Use the case laws there. Use the arguments there to your benefit. Bring a claim against the judge. Once you bring a criminal complaint against the judge, I also would suggest once you document that you filed the criminal complaint with the attorney general, file a restraining order against the judge. Well, you have a criminal complaint that you filed with the attorney general. You have a copy of the com criminal complaint that you filed with the attorney general that is stamped received. Now you go and you get a restraining order against the judge. Now you bring your civil complaint against the judge. Why? Does it matter if the criminal complaint doesn't The attorney general has a, uh, what do you call it, an obligation to all criminal allegations. Ladies and gentlemen, I have less than 10 seconds, so I have to let you go. I said this is 30 minutes. If you pay attention to what was said, 
you can get yourself started on how to handle yourself in court. Stop arguing with these idiots. All right, take care of yourselves. Got to go.